In this video, we'll build on everything we've covered so far to understand how we can use regression models to estimate causal effects. In the last video, we discussed the process of formulating clear causal questions and using contextual knowledge to draw causal graphs. We'll start from the causal graph that we drew last time. This graph could represent the context for an observational internet study of the effect of implementation intentions on the likelihood of voting. The next stage in our analysis is to step through the deseparation process that allows us to block association flow along non-causal paths and maintain association flow along causal paths. We have one causal path, the chain A to Y in blue. This chain generates the desired causal parts of associations that we want to keep. There are three non-causal paths in orange, two paths through the confounders P and E, and one path resulting from selection bias. These non-causal paths generate unwanted associations between treatment and outcome that lead to a lack of exchangeability and that we would like to block. Pause the video here and take a minute to identify an appropriate conditioning set. Our conditioning set Z should include P, E, and M. P and E block the first two paths because they're the middle nodes of chains. The third path is open because of our inherent conditioning on the selection node S, which is the collider on the path. We would want to condition on U1, U2, or M, but since the U variables are unmeasured, we have to condition on M. This means that we have exchangeability of the voting potential outcomes across treatment groups, conditional on P, E, and M. This means that we can look within subsets of the data defined by party, education, and mail-in ballots and fairly compare the average outcome, the probability of voting, between the treatment groups. We can do this in a straightforward way with regression models. Because the outcome, voting, is binary, we can fit a logistic regression model to simultaneously quantify the relationship between treatment and outcome while conditioning on P, E, and M. Note that by conditional exchangeability, this model can be equivalently written as shown in the second line. This motivates a more intervention-oriented interpretation of the treatment coefficient. The estimated beta-1 coefficient for treatment is an estimate of the average causal effect. It's the change in log odds of voting if all study units were to use clear implementation intentions as compared to if all study units did not use implementation intentions. When holding fixed party affiliation, years of education, and ownership of a mail-in ballot. The language of all study units use and all study units do not use is a reflection of the definition of the two potential outcomes, Y1 and Y0. The potential outcome under treatment, Y1, is the voting outcome that would result if treatment were used, and the potential outcome under no treatment, Y0, is the voting outcome that would result if no treatment were used. Our interpretation of beta 1 was on the log scale. To have a more interpretable causal effect, we can exponentiate the beta 1 coefficient to move the effect from the log scale to the natural scale. For example, if this coefficient were estimated to be 0 0.1, then the exponentiated coefficient 1.105 indicates that if all study units used clear implementation intentions, the odds of voting would be multiplied by 1.105 as compared to all stu study units not using implementation intentions. Again, this multiplicative change is while fixing party affiliation, years of education, and ownership of a mail-in ballot. When using regression models to estimate causal effects, we still need to follow sound model building principles. That is, the validity of a causal interpretation of the treatment coefficient in this model is contingent on correctly specifying the form for the model. No interaction terms are present currently, but should they be? And currently, all predictors have linear relationships with the log odds, but would nonlinear relationships be appropriate? Visualizations can guide us here. For example, if we were curious about interaction between party and mail-in ballot, we can make bar plots like these that show the relationship between voting and party for those with and without mail-in ballots. The difference in probability of voting between Democrats and Republicans is small for those with without mail-in ballots, but appreci appreciably larger in those with mail-in ballots. The relationship between party and voting is different 
between mail-in ballot groups. So this is suggestive of interaction. A small technical note, even though the difference in relationships is clear here, this visualization is on the probability scale rather than the log odds scale. If we transformed the y-axis of this bar plot to the log odds scale via probability to odds to log odds, and we still saw a difference in the relationships, that would be even more suggestive of an interaction for the scale that logistic regression uses. But as it stands, this plot is an entirely reasonable way to explore interaction, and it would be reasonable to include an interaction term between party and mail-in ballots in the model. What about nonlinearity? The quantitative predictors are the variables that might have nonlinear relationships. Here, we would want to make a visualization of years of education and voting. For one quantitative and one categorical variable, a box plot might come to mind, but a box plot is actually not effective for assessing a nonlinear relationship between years of education and voting. We actually want a scatter plot like this. Even though it doesn't quite look like scatter plots of quantitative variables, the smooth trend line in blue ends up being very useful. The smoothing line is obtained using a technique called local regression. In this context, local regression effectively averages the zeros and ones in small sliding windows across the horizontal axis to estimate the probability of voting as a function of years of education. So this blue smooth certainly looks nonlinear, but remember that the y-axis of this plot is on the probability scale rather than the log odds scale. So it's not clear from just this whether the relationship between voting and education should be nonlinear in the logistic regression model. We can add the predictions from a model with a linear relationship using another ggplot smoothing layer. Don't worry too much about this code for the moment, but note that aspects of it are very similar to how logistic regression models are fit in R namely the GLM and the family equals binomial parts. The formula, the formula y tilde x indicates to R that we want to see the predictions from a logistic regression model where the predictor variable has a linear relationship with the outcome. The fact that the predictions in red line up very well with the observed probabilities in blue means that a model with education having a linear relationship with the log odds of voting works well in this case. Let's see an example where nonlinearity would be a better fit. For this data, the predictions in red are now a bit further from the observed probabilities in blue. Let's change the formula part of the last bit of ggplot code to generate predictions from a model with a nonlinear relationship. Here we've modified the formula part of the red smoothing line to use a type of nonlinear function called natural splines. We won't discuss splines deeply, but effectively, natural splines are different cubic functions that are stitched together horizontally to create a final smooth looking function. The nsx3 part of the code is instructing R to cut the x variable three times to make four regions, and in each of these four regions, a cubic polynomial will be fit to the data so that the polynomials flow smoothly from region to region. The main idea with natural splines is that they're nice ways to model nonlinearity. So combining our insights from our visualizations, we might fit a logistic regression model that looks like this in R. We've included our treatment variable, which is called A in our data, a nonlinear relationship with education, and an interaction between political party and having a mail-in ballot. When we look at the summary output, we'll focus our attention on the results for the treatment variable, the coefficient it's at estimate itself, which is an estimate of the average causal effect, as well as inferential metrics like the confidence interval and p-value. Because we're working with a logistic regression model, we'll want to exponentiate both the coefficient estimate and the confidence interval endpoints to report results on an interpretable scale. The causal effect, the odds ratio, being greater than 1, and the confidence interval endpoints being both greater than 1, suggest a positive causal effect of implementation and intentions on the likelihood to vote. It may be tempting to want to interpret all coefficients in this model as being causal effects, but really only the treatment coefficient has a causal interpretation. This is because our deseparation analysis only blocked non-causal paths relative to A being the treatment and Y being the outcome. If, for example, we wanted to use the same model output and view political party as the treatment variable, 
we'd end up blocking a causal path by conditioning on the A variable. It's worth revisiting our causal graph to check this for yourself. Also, in our original graph building, we ignored some types of confounders that weren't needed for our A to Y investigation. This is another reason that these non-treatment variables can't be interpreted causally. The tendency to overinterpret extra regression coefficients causally is so common in the literature that it's been given a name, the table two fallacy. Often in research articles, the second table in the article presents a table of regression coefficients, just like the one that we saw. And historically, people have commonly interpreted coefficients other than the treatment as causal effects, even though it's completely unwarranted. It's worth making a quick note about the generalizability of findings. Because our data come from users of our website, our results really only generalize to those types of people. More generally, whenever there are selection nodes in our causal graphs, those selection variables and causes of those selection variables determine the population to which our results generalize. Trying to generalize results to populations different from the study population is a very difficult problem and an active area of research in the causal inference community. Let's return to our original research question one more time to briefly highlight another use case of regression models. We originally wanted to know the causal effect of implement implementation intentions, the effect of voting if the entire study population used them as opposed to not using them. What if we're also interested in a more targeted effect? That is, what if we want to know about causal effects in subgroups? For example, we might additionally ask, how does the causal effect differ between political parties? The answer to this is likely of great interest to campaign workers of both parties. We can actually answer this question with regression models as well by including an interaction between treatment and the party variable. The beta-6 coefficient would give the difference in causal effects between political parties. So note that including political party in an interaction with treatment involves conditioning on political party. Because party was already in our deseparating set, this is fine. But more generally, we need to be careful in case we want to look at subgroup variables that aren't already in our deseparating set. Just in case conditioning on those variables opens up new non-causal paths from treatment to outcome. So let's summarize what we've covered about using regression in practice. We first construct a causal graph using contextual knowledge, ideally in consultation with subject matter experts. Building off of this model, we can use deseparation to block non-causal paths. The set of variables that blocks these non-causal paths is what makes the treatment groups conditionally exchangeable. These variables along with treatment will serve as predictors in a regression model, and we can use visualizations to help us specify as appropriate a form as possible for the model. And if we're interested in understanding how the causal effect of treatment differs across subgroups, we can fit a model where the subgroup variable is involved in an interaction term with treatment. When we fit the model and interpret output, we need to be wary about the extent to which our results generalize. Looking at selection nodes can clarify this. And we also need to be careful to not fall prey to the table two fallacy and interpret all model coefficients causally. Only coefficients associated with the treatment variable can be interpreted causally. So while regression is a very useful tool, it has its limitations. The strategy that regression uses is to block non-causal paths by conditioning on variables, boxing nodes on the causal graph. In some cases, trying to fully block non-causal paths by conditioning will end up being impossible because we end up needing to condition on a collision node on a non-causal path. Another technique for estimating causal effects essentially removes troublesome arrows in non-causal paths. This technique is called inverse probability weighting, and we'll discuss this next.